Hey everyone, this is Nick and man am I excited for this news video because once again Meta is getting their ass handed to them and who would not love that? So this week we have Meta being told by the EU that no, they can't just force people to accept the collection of their data and its use for targeted ads just because they decide to use their service. We also have Linux Mint 21.1 beta which is full of new stuff even for a point release and we have the Asahi Linux team managing to develop a functional GPU driver for all Apple Silicon Macs. And of course there's a lot more good stuff about Linux and open source like today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing. Safing makes the Portmaster an open source tool to take back control of your internet connection. It's free of charge and it lets you see every connection every application makes. And it lets you act on these connections by blocking ads and trackers, malware, not safe for work stuff or scams. With auto blocking capabilities and even the ability to use a DNS provider of your choice. You can of course create your own rules globally or per application. Portmaster is available as a DEB or an RPM package. It's in the AUR or you can also install it on Windows. Using it is free of charge and they have paid tiers starting at 3 euros per month to support the development or 9.9 euros per month if you want the total package including the SPN which is a VPN on steroids that uses a different IP address for every connection so you're truly impossible to track. So click the link in the description to download the Portmaster. So Meta has suffered yet another blow to its business model, this time delivered by the European Union. Facebook and Instagram forced users to agree to targeted ads using their data inside of Facebook and Instagram just by accepting to use the service, by adding a clause in their terms of service which basically said they agreed to be targeted if they wanted to access the platforms. Meta lets users opt out of targeted ads from other applications and websites but they don't let users say that they don't want what they do on Meta's own apps to be used to target them. This clause has been declared illegal on Monday by the EU. The ruling hasn't been disclosed publicly but the European Commission called for Ireland's Data Protection Commission to issue public orders that do reflect this new decision along with significant fines for Meta. Meta can still appeal this ruling which will suspend the decision until the final verdict is reached and the company was very quick to point that out saying that GDPR still allowed them to process data beyond consent or performance of a contract which is probably just a panic statement to avoid the stock price falling even lower. The company says it's cooperating with Ireland's Data Protection Commission and the final decision is expected in January. But if it's upheld, it will deal another crucial blow to Meta's business model which very heavily relies on these targeted ads and has already been hurt a lot by Apple's tracking protection features in iOS. Basically Meta would have to offer a visible opt-out for users to decide to not allow them to use data from their apps to target them with ads which would lead to their ad network being less interesting for advertisers and so less money in the end. And I truly hope that this decision is upheld if only because I really dislike Meta and all their stuff but also because targeted ads are only okay if users are aware that their data is being used to target them and if they actually agree to it. What Meta does right now hiding this into the terms of service is absolutely contrary at least to the spirit of GDPR and so I don't see the European Commission backing down on this. Hopefully. Linux Mint 21.1 Vera had its first public beta release. It still has critical bugs and should obviously only be used if you're okay with losing work or having to fix issues manually. But the list of new features isn't small by any means with desktop icons being tidied up only showing essential items. Color for the various themes are now more vibrant and look nicer and this also means that they use less of these colors throughout the system with these not being used on the panel anymore or in the menus. Folder icons are now yellow with a colored stripe. The First Steps app still lets you pick the theme and colors so you will be able to experiment a bit. 
The mouse pointer also was changed to the Bibata theme, which looks pretty cool, and the system sounds have been changed to use Material Design V2 sounds. And more icon themes have been added, including Breeze, Papyrus, Numix, and Yaru. Now looks aren't the only focus though, with the driver manager running without needing a password and being able to use live USB drives to install drivers, Flatpak is now fully integrated in the update manager, letting you update everything in a single place, and the software manager now has a refreshed user interface, letting you distinguish between Flatpaks and regular packages and switch from one to the other with the usual drop-down menu. The default apps got a bit of attention as well with the ability to configure the login screen's mouse pointer, Warpinator getting more security, and the web app manager letting you edit more settings, like adding a navigation bar or private browsing. Mint 21.1 uses Cinnamon 5.6 with its new corner bar, which lets you set a custom action when clicking or middle-clicking that small applet in the bottom right corner of the panel. Selected files will no longer be overlaid with the color that your theme uses, the display settings are now accessible right from the context menu of the desktop, Nemo is getting a much improved path bar, and there's a lot more than that. Mint 21.1 looks like a really, really huge update, especially for a small point release. I wasn't planning to make a video on it, but if my release schedule allows it, I might do so. If you wanted an Apple Silicon Mac to run Linux, you'll be happy to know that the Asahi Linux developers now have added support for the GPU and for hardware acceleration. Now, of course, it's still in alpha, it's pre-release like most of the Asahi Linux project, but it's already enough to run your desktop environment smoothly and even some games. It supports OpenGL 2.1 and OpenGL ES 2.0 on M1 and M2 systems. It doesn't support Vulkan yet, so don't expect to play your whole library of Windows games on Linux running on a Mac just yet. This new driver should work on all Apple Silicon devices, including the Pro, Max, or Ultra variants, and to get them, you just need to run the Asahi Edge kernel and install the Mesa Asahi Edge package. Obviously, you should expect bugs, lockups, or crashes, but it's still an amazing development and quite fast too. And you can expect this code to land in the regular Mesa packages once it's fully ready, just like you can expect all the Asahi Linux code to land in the Linux kernel, the main one, when it's ready as well. Which means that all distros will be able to benefit from that work, which is pretty freaking awesome. Now, this week, GNOME developers have been working on automating the testing of their compositor, which is responsible for displaying windows and handling their interactions. The tests will be ran after each merge request to test that the basic stuff is still working, which should save some debugging time in the future. They also plan to expand these tests to more scenarios. On top of that, they improved performance for GStreamer, the media engine, to use a lot less CPU, from 400 to 500%, down to 10 to 15%. The settings app is also having some work done for the device security panel, the accessibility panel, which is now redesigned with a more modern navigation, which should make its way to other settings pages in the future. And other panels received more polish and became more mobile friendly. There's also a new application called Meeting Point, which is a big blue button client. It's early days, but it lets you watch the webcam stream of participants, access the group chat, listen to audio, and join meetings, of course. There's also Black Fennec, a new app to view and edit JSON files in a more graphical way. Good work on the automated testing and performance. Not that I had any of these issues on GNOME recently, but it's still good to make sure that whatever they try to develop or implement is going to be automatically tested, and so there should be less bugs and less regressions and less performance issues in the future. And in KDE land, we have the new advanced tiling system, which landed. While it won't replace a dedicated tiling window manager, it will be a good middle ground for people who want to keep the stock compositor and window manager, KWIN, but want some more advanced features. It lets you create custom tile layouts and resize all windows at once if they are adjacent. The APIs it uses can also be used by third-party scripts that want to do more, and that's also coming in Plasma 5.27 early next year. Now, like I said last week, you can now also browse iOS devices natively in Dolphin, and console got a hamburger menu, like most other default KDE apps. 
KDE also got support for the Global Shortcuts Portal, which means that on Wayland, you will be able to use these a lot more. This was a big pain point, so it's nice to see it fixed. On top of that, the screen chooser dialog when sharing your screen on Wayland will now display thumbnails of the windows you can share. And there are a lot of smaller user interface related improvements for Dolphin, Discover and the Plasma panels. This new tiling feature is probably going to be the headline one for Plasma 5.27. And honestly, when I used Pop! OS, the auto tiling stuff was really, really awesome. So if Plasma can have something like that out of the box, I think it's going to make a big, big improvement. Something I missed last week, but it looks like Proton, the privacy suite of online tools, not the compatibility layer for Linux gaming, has released a roadmap for what they will be working on in 2023. And there's some very interesting stuff. Proton Mail will get scheduled sent to program emails in advance and send them later. And it will get new tracking protections to block trackers in emails, so they won't know if you've opened the mail at all. It will also gain reminders to well, remind you to respond to a certain email, or you can snooze an email so they are out of the way, but they are not discarded. Emails will also be automatically categorized in the inbox. There will be full text search in emails in the mobile apps and deeper integration with the whole Proton suite, like automatically generating a link to Proton Drive for large email attachments, single sign-on for mobile apps, and more. Proton Calendar will gain tasks and to-do lists, better sharing to let people view your availability, and a full agenda view to see what's up next in your day. You will also be able to view local holidays, add contacts birthdays, and a local weather forecast. Now that Proton Suite is improving really, really fast. And sure, it's not a full replacement for all Google services. They don't have a Google Search, they don't have a Google Docs, they're lacking a few things. But if what you use is Gmail, Google Calendar, and Google Drive, Basically, use Proton instead. Now let's move on to the gaming news. Lutris also got a new release, version 0.5.12, which adds support for emulating OG Xbox games with XMU and fixes authentication issues with Origin, the Epic Game Store, and Ubisoft Connect. It also adds Discord rich presence, the ability to extract icons from Windows executables, and setting custom cover art for games. The Flatpak isn't yet up to date, but it should be soon. There's also a new graphical tool to manage your Proton versions called Proton Plus. It's basically like Proton Up, but designed with GTK, so it will look a lot better on GNOME. It's early days, but it lets you view all the versions you have installed, where they are located, and install new ones. It works with Steam and Lutris, with support for Heroic and Bottles planned, but not currently working. And it's available on Flathub. Now, speaking of Proton, there's a new release, version 7.0-5, which makes a bunch of games playable like Rift, Unravel 2, Battle Realms, Bulletstorm, and a lot more. A huge bunch of bugs and performance issues are also fixed in this one, and as always, you don't have anything to do to get it. Steam will download it for you. And as a last little thing, it looks like Intel is actually using DXVK, to power the DirectX 9 part of their Intel Arc GPU drivers. Yes, they're using DXVK to run games because they couldn't be bothered to develop a DX9 implementation for their whole new GPUs. Now, admittedly, all these games using DX9 run absolutely horribly on these GPUs, so I don't know what they've been doing with DXVK, but still, it's cool that they've implemented it, I guess. Cool? Like today's sponsor! If you're looking for a new device to run Linux on, stop trying to buy Windows laptops and trying to slap Linux and pray and hope and use some elbow grease to fix what doesn't work. Click the link in the description below to get a Tuxedo device instead, because their computers, desktops and laptops are all made to run Linux specifically. Actually, they ship with Linux out of the box. The Tuxedo is based in Germany, but they ship worldwide, and they have a big, big selection from small desktops, Nux, Ultrabooks, cheap laptops, powerful laptops, gaming workstations, gaming towers, whatever you need, they have it. And they have a big range of configurations for each of these devices, including your own logo laser etched on the lid of your laptop, or your own custom keyboard layout laser etched on the keys of your laptop. So if you need a new device to run Linux on, 
Why bother with manufacturers that don't give a crap about Linux? Go to Tuxedo instead. I left a link in the description below. Grab yourself a laptop or a desktop if you need one. They're really, really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, there's always that small dislike button. And a comment down there would be appreciated to let me know what I can do better. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to help me make more of these videos, you can always click the super thanks button on YouTube underneath this video. There's a PayPal link in the description. And there are also links to my Patreon memberships and YouTube memberships. Subscribers of both get access to a weekly podcast on Monday where I talk about Linux, tech, open source, my personal life, the channel, everything really. And you also get to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel. And you also get a preview of what I'll be covering next month. So if you're interested, both links are in the description below. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!